Hi, welcome to Fair Trade 101. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Leah, and today the topic we're going to talk about is what is fair trade and why does it matter? I'm going to assume that you're here for one of these reasons. Uh, you may have heard of fair trade, but you're not sure what it is and you're curious to learn. Or you might be familiar with fair trade already, but you'd like to know more about how to work it into your life. You may have seen various ethical certifications. You're not super sure where fair trade fits into all of that. Or you've got no idea what fair trade is, but you had a free evening and you thought you'd stop by. <laughs> so no matter what you're here for, um, I'm glad you made the choice to be here. So thanks for, thanks for joining me tonight. And why am I here giving this webinar? Who the heck am I to be calling myself a fair trade expert? Well, I'm Leah Walsh. I'm the owner of Rosette Fairtrade, which is an online store that sells fair trade products. I'm really glad that you could make it tonight and that I got to uh, virtually meet you. I've been an advocate for fair trade since 2011 and I started Rosette because I wanted not only to make it easier for consumers to learn about fair trade and to be aware of these issues, but also to make it easier to buy products in one central place. I'm also here because I'm passionate about helping consumers make choices that align with their own personal values. So whether that's going vegan and cruelty free, whether that's buying organic because you're a tree hugger like I am, uh, I really like to encourage people to buy things that are in line with their values. So they're putting their money where uh, their values are. So order of the day, what we're going to talk about in this webinar, um, we're going to start with why does fair trade exist in the first place? What kinds of standards does fair trade have? Who oversees fair trade products? Which fair trade products are currently available in Canada and where can I buy them both locally and online? So we've only got a half hour. We want to stay on track. So let's jump right in. Why does fair trade exist? Well, you might recognize this photo. This is from 2013, the Rana Plaza disaster. So this is what fair trade is not. Um, in Dhaka, which is an area of Bangladesh that has a ton of garment factories, an eight-story building containing several factories uh, collapsed on April 24th, and you can see in the photo it was absolutely devastating. There were over 3,000 garment workers in the building at the time. 1,134 people died with approximately 2,500 others injured. And the garment factories made clothes for many well-known brands, uh, including Joe Fresh and Walmart. Joe Fresh, of course, is the one that is available in Loblaws and the affiliated stores. And I want to be clear, this was not just an unfortunate accident. There was a ton leaning up to it that was avoidable, and we're going to talk about that. So the owners did know that there were cracks in the structure, and they had been told it was not safe to go to work that day. They were The garment workers were forced to return to work anyway by the owners, who said that if they did not, they would lose a month's pay. The top four floors of the building had been constructed without a permit, and it was actually designed to be a retail space, which doesn't have the same heavy machinery and strong vibrations from those machinery. Uh, so it was actually structurally not sound for the purpose that it was be, being used for. So all of this just made a recipe for disaster. So why did this happen? Well, workers in the developing world are often not protected by strong labor laws. And if they exist, they may not be well enforced either because the government doesn't have the resources to do so or because they're just not aware because some stuff is done in a really kind of backwards and hidden kind of way. And managers in manufacturing industries report feeling a ton of pressure to meet quotas and increase production. So even the managers who are managing the garment workers are not really on the garment workers side. They just want to make sure that they make their quotas. And if they don't, they get a bunch of trouble from their boss. So it's, uh, it's sort of this, this, uh, uh line of, of, uh, pressure coming from, uh, from the top, from the big companies. Long and complicated supply chains keep consumers from knowing how their products are made. So corporations can do basically anything they want because the consumer is none the wiser. And so unless we're really doing our research and keeping on top of what every single company of, that's making every single product we're buying is doing, we have no idea where our products are actually coming from. 
And I want to be clear, this is not just about the garment industry. I want to talk about chocolate because everyone loves chocolate. Um, And it's not just Bangladesh either. So 33%, that's how much of the world's cocoa uh, is produced in Cote d'Ivoire, which if you've ever looked at a map of Africa and and located Cote d'Ivoire, it is teeny. It is a tiny country. So the idea that they're producing 33% of the world's cocoa is pretty bananas. <laughs> um, and at the same time, over 800,000, this number is more unfortunate. Uh, it is how many children are estimated to be working on cocoa farms in Cote d'Ivoire as of 2018. Just think about that. 800,000. That's like the, that's slightly less than the population of Ottawa. Um, it is a huge number when you think about it. And those are children who are on farms uh, instead of being in school, which is really not cool. So why does this happen? Cocoa prices have really been falling in the past uh, few years and they don't cover the cost of ethical humane production anymore. So what's happening is they resort to, farmers resort to buying trafficked children. And if this number doesn't horrify you, then I think you don't have a heart, (laughs) but, the average child is purchased for only $250. To put that into perspective, that's half of an iPad. So this is an actual living, breathing human that is being sold to somebody else for their labor in 2018, 2019, like today for $250, half of the price of an iPad. So the whole situation is pretty horrifying. The problem is that extreme poverty in the region means that children often do work to support their families. So it makes them really vulnerable to traffickers who come to them and say, hey, I can offer you a paid job and you can help support your family and you'll just have to come with me and uh, we'll be able to send money home to your family and everything will be okay. Uh, These children are really vulnerable to that because of course they want to help out and there's a ton of poverty where they live. So it's just a recipe again for disaster. So what's the common thread here? What's the commonality between children farming cocoa and garment factory workers being uh, killed in disasters like the Rana Plaza disaster? Well, it's valuing people less than profit. So if, (laughs) if we would just take a moment to say, hey, there is something more important than profit and it's human life, then these things wouldn't be happening. So fair trade aims to flip that model. And so there's a triple bottom line. You've got your handy dandy graphic here. And the idea is sustainability, not just environmental sustainability, but to combat these kinds of human and workers' rights violations. We're talking about putting people and planet right alongside with profit as a triple bottom line. So sort of living in that intersection of those three is where fair trade tries to be. What does fair trade cover in terms of an area? Uh, So the scope and size of fair trade is essentially we're looking at products that are produced in the global south. The global south is is also known as the developing world or what have you. It's just basically warm countries that are typically south of the equator and they have a specific place in the world of produ- of um, agricultural production because there are certain crops that it can only grow in those regions. Many of the products currently verified or certified by fair trade bodies just don't grow in Canada. You cannot grow bananas here. You cannot grow cocoa here. You cannot grow coffee here. So there's many of these different commodities that are hugely popular and that we're absolutely importing and consuming that are coming from places in the global south that the workers may not be very well protected. And fun fact, recently a few countries, including South Africa and Brazil, have become both producer and consumer countries. So we're looking at, in South Africa, there's a really great example. It's called House of Mandela. It's a, um, it's, they, are, they are Nelson Mandela's family. They have a really well-known uh, wine vineyard there. And they produce this beautiful fair trade wine, and then they sell it domestically to South Africans. So it's sort of like this hybrid of like the local food movement and the fair trade food movement. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. I don't see a lot of that happening in Canada in the near future, just because so little (laughs) of what we, of what we produce can be consumed. Like we can't 
really sustain ourselves fully, but from what we can produce locally very well yet. Um, but maybe in the, the distant future, we'll see something like that starting to happen in Canada. Right now, there's a priority on developer, uh, um, sorry, producers in the developing world because there is so much need there and there are so few protections uh, available to them that we're really encouraging people to, uh, if they're going to import products, to make it fair trade. But it is a really interesting uh, development I thought I would share with you. So what kinds of standards does fair trade have? So the World Fair Trade Organization, or the WFTO, has 10 principles of fair trade, and they do a lot of really interesting work around uh, bringing together the fair trade movement and just sort of doing that sort of uh, foundational work of setting, you know, what are the standard, or sorry, the principles and the ideas behind fair trade and how do we keep them strong? So they're a really interesting organization for that reason. And the first principle of fair trade, according to the WFTO, is opportunities for disadvantaged producers. We talked about that already a little bit, but basically producers who are in the developing world who are being exploited because they're too far away for us to notice what's happening to them. Transparency and accountability so that there's shorter supply chains, for example, and we know where our products are coming from. Fair trading practices, so not just sort of forcing producers to do this race to the bottom where they offer you know, a price that's less than it costs them to produce uh, their product, making sure that there's fair uh, relationships between buyer and seller in fair trade. Payment of a fair price, so making sure that it covers the cost of production. There are minimum price uh, uh, requirements in fair trade, so making sure that they can cover those costs and you know have enough to have a living wage. You know, be able to pay for their basics and send their kids to school and all of those things. Speaking of which, no forced labor, and that includes child labor. So making sure that kids are in school instead of in the fields. Now that doesn't mean that they can't help out a little bit with their family farm after they come home from school, but making sure that they have that education so that they have a future is crucial. We have gender equity, non-discrimination, and freedom of association. There's not that much, depending on the certifier and the product we're talking about, there's not that much hired labor in fair trade. So in food crops particularly, we have a lot of smallholder farms who will build a cooperative. Uh, so it's mostly just the family working on their own farm and then they band together with many other small farms. So there's not a lot of hired labor there. But in cases where there is, they have to be able to unionize. Also, in the cooperative or in the artisan group or whatever is being, uh, you know, looked at by this fair trade organization, uh, women have to be able to vote, for example, or you can't say, no, you can't work here because this is your religion or any of those things. So there's a non-discrimination element as well. They have to have good working conditions, making sure that people are, you know, not having unsafe conditions like what happened in Rana Plaza, that people have protection if they're using hazardous materials, all of those different things. Capacity building, improving how well they produce. So if this is an, a farmer organization, for example, perhaps learning composting so that they have organic fertilizer that they can use for their crops. Uh, perhaps it means uh, improving uh, their capacity in, in that they can now build a processing facility in their uh, their cooperative so that they don't have to send it up the hill and pay that guy to do it, but they can keep more money right in that community. Uh, it, it really depends on what the product is and what the the um, uh, producer decides to do with it, but uh, there is often a fair trade premium depending on who the certifier or verifier is that they're able to reinvest in these kinds of projects. So promotion of fair trade, and this means basically if you've got a, a you know, there's a great fair trade cooperative and some farmer notices and says, hey, how do I get in on this that you don't say, no, nope, not allowed. <laughs> so being able to then extend resources to that person to learn more about it or what have you is important as well. And on the um, consumer side, when you have businesses, for example, uh, in Canada, they have to be able to promote on behalf of the producer to encourage uh, people to purchase the goods because if they don't, then the producer might go through the trouble of getting their farm certified and then not be able to sell enough to fair trade buyers and then have to take the rest to market and then they make a huge loss. And last but not least, respect for the environment. So making sure that uh, I think it's pretty self self explanatory, but making sure that we're not just you know polluting water and using these nasty chemicals and all of these things, uh, and also 
many shade grown coffees and so on happen under fair trade so that we can preserve habitat. So if you want more information about the principles of fair trade, you can check out this website I've put here from the, the World Fair Trade Organization. Uh, they do a lot of great work around that kind of stuff. Now that's sort of the ideas behind fair trade. I'm gonna get into the standards a little bit. Um, but they are very detailed and very strict. I don't think there's anything about keeping off the grass, so we should be safe there. <laughs> but every product such as handicrafts, cocoa, soccer balls, uh, if, you're, if you're growing coffee versus rice, everything is done a little bit differently, so everything needs its own standards. That's why it gets so detailed and so specific. So fair trade certifiers will make sure that a specific product had a ethical supply chain that the workers were being treated fairly on the farm and all the way up to the business that's packaging, marketing it and all of those things. And it uh, certifies the specific product. So these products will then be able to have a fair trade logo on them to tell the consumer that that product specifically has been certified. Whereas verifying bodies will look at the entire company and they'll make sure that the company itself is behaving ethically. So this is very common with, for example, handicrafts, where you have an artisan group who's creating the items. The, the item itself might be made out of, you know, recycled materials or something. Who knows where that came from or who grew the, you know, the, the pulp that was used in the paper that was then recycled in the craft or what have you, right? So it's really about making sure that the artisan group itself is behaving ethically and treating its workers properly. So in these cases, often you'll see what are called membership or verifying bodies, where the whole organization or company is a member. And so everything they produce is considered to be fair trade because they're doing it in an ethical way. So because of that, you often won't actually have any kind of fair trade logo on the product because the entire company is covered. If you want the details of the specific standards for a specific product in a specific country, <laughs> you can definitely get that. If you're a legal speak geek or anything like that, you can check out um, on the certifier or verifier website, which we're gonna get into. The very next thing we're gonna talk about is who is looking at um, overseeing all of this stuff, the different organizations. If you wanna see what their specific standards are in a particular product in a particular area, I encourage you to check out their website, just sort of Google the organization and you'll be able to read for days. There is so much information. It's very detailed, it's very legal, but it's all there and it's all very transparent. So have at, definitely go for it. Because we're considering this a 101 and we're trying to finish in a half hour, we're gonna keep it simple and we're gonna keep it general. So uh, my apologies for not being able to dive in too, too deep tonight. So who oversees fair trade products? There's a number of organizations. We're gonna start with Fair Trade International and the small producer symbol. And these are certifiers. So Fair Trade International, this is the one on the left, is considered by most fair trade advocates to be the gold standard of certification. So they do have the strictest standards and they do conduct regular audits, which are on a surprise basis. So people can't just sort of get their act together because they know that the fair trade people are coming to audit them. Um, and they mostly certify food items, but they do also do cotton for various clothing and so on and sports balls. So that's sort of the scope of the fair trade international symbol, which is the one on the left here. The small producer symbol is nearly identical to Fairtrade International, but it only certifies smallholder producers. So you're not eligible for the symbol. This is the one on the right, uh, unless you are a small scale producer. This is great because it adds an extra social and economic uh, benefit because social environmental, sorry, uh, benefit because smallholder farms are much, much better for the environment. And they also help to keep uh, individual families and so on out of poverty as opposed to a more corporate structure where who knows who that money is going to it might just be going to the guy at the top so that's a, a really great project that's happening by producers for producers uh, really encourage you to support it that's the spp or the small producer symbol so I, i'm not just dyslexic it does stand for the spanish version that's why spp doesn't match small producer symbol <laughs> Anyway, that's a really cool project. Uh, definitely don't feel that if you see that symbol, it's not as good as the other fair trade symbol. They are both very, very strong symbols. I encourage you to support them. Then there's Fair Trade Federation, which is a verification or membership based organization. And Fair Trade Federation will 
maybe yes, maybe no, put the product uh, or the, sorry, the logo on the product, but it is going to look at the whole company or artisan group. They do a ton of stuff with handicrafts. So it makes a lot of sense that they would be membership based because again, like who knows where that like recycled material comes from that they use in their handicrafts. And from that point, once the company or artisan group is approved, they just have to maintain their membership. So making sure that they're behaving ethically and and keeping up with the standards that the, the Federation has. And all of the items then from that producer are considered fair trade because they're a member of the Fair Trade Federation. The World Fair Trade Organization is another verification slash membership based organization. So They do uh, a similar thing as the Fair Trade Federation, where they look at the whole company and make sure that it meets the standards. So once they've done that, once the company gets the status, they just have to maintain the membership in the WFTO, uh, make sure they comply with all of the, the requirements. And the WFTO tends to do less verifying and more collaboration actually with other fair trade organizations. Um, so they were the ones who did the 10 principles of fair trade that we saw earlier, for example. And they do a lot of work like that, that just sort of helps to strengthen the movement as a whole. So they're a really interesting organization as well. And finally, we have Fair for Life, which is a certifier. So this is kind of like the Fair Trade International and the small producer symbol that we saw at the very beginning. So they are going to look at specific products again and look at specific standards for those products and see what did the supply chain do? Was it done ethically? Okay, great. Now you can have the logo and you can put that on the product. And usually you will see that. Now, it won't necessarily be orange. A lot of time it's like black and white or something to match better with the branding of the product. And because it was created by an organic certifier, Fair for Life actually has the strongest environmental protections, um, but it's not quite as strong at the social and economic standards as, say, Fair Trade International. But I put them here because I think they're doing some great work. They do uh, do really good job of, of uh, protecting the environment as well. So these are symbols to look for if you're out at your store, if you're looking online, anything like that. These are symbols to look for. As I mentioned, the two round ones, so the Fair Trade Federation and the World Fair Trade Organization, are more membership based. You may or may not see the symbol on the product, but if you do see them, you know that they're fair trade. So which fair trade products are currently available in Canada? That's a great question and tons is the short answer, but you have to know where to look. So these are some products that are really common. You know, if you have a health food store in town, they probably have like organic foods and all that stuff. Uh, If you have like the organic, we call it the organic neighborhood in your grocery. (laughs) Um, They usually have like, you know, the the aisle that has like the organic and gluten-free and vegan and like all that stuff. Uh, That's really where you're going to be looking for fair trade stuff. So you can usually find coffee, tea, chocolate, sugar in that area of your mainstream grocery store uh, or at your health food store. And sometimes you'll get bananas. Uh, Farm Boy in Ontario and IG in Quebec both have bananas that are fair trade, which is excellent. Um, But more excitingly, and this is more in a mainstream grocery, there's now fair trade ice cream, which is super exciting. (laughs) I don't know if you love ice cream like me, but I was really excited to hear that. Um, and so Ben and Jerry's recently, well, not recently anymore, a couple of years ago now, uh, for a few years has been uh, fair trade certified. So these are what are you going to find in sort of a more mainstream place, whereas it's a little tougher to find this stuff, but it's also available in Canada. So we have grains, so like rice, quinoa, granola, things like that, uh, spices and olive oil, dried fruit, like mangoes, pineapples, uh, clothing honey, beeswax, beauty products like soap, lip balm, etc., handicrafts and jewelry, and alcohol. You can get a ton of alcohol at the Manitoba Manitoba Liquor, I can't remember, Manitoba Liquor Board, I think it's called, uh, is such a leader in fair trade in terms of getting, you know, fair trade wine and fair trade alcohol into Manitoba liquor stores. Uh, But also we have the LCBO in Ontario. I can confirm that you will be able to find some fair trade wine there. It's not always, it's kind of hit and miss. So, you know, if you go on a certain day, you may not find a lot, whereas another day you'll find tons. So uh, it really depends on location, depends on when you go and all that stuff. But if you're in Manitoba, never fear. (laughs) 
48%. That number I put there because it's, uh, it's, it's kind of challenging, but also an opportunity. So um, 48% is the portion of fair trade farmers who produce coffee. So we're looking at an industry now that is like really, really strongly skewed towards coffee. It's both an opportunity to challenge, right? How do we support fair trade farmers? Because coffee is also already so visible, it's important to support other fair trade crops also like bananas, spices, cocoa, et cetera. But at the same time, if we don't support them, these fair trade coffee farmers might need to sell their amazing fair trade certified coffee at non-fair trade prices if there isn't enough demand. Because if they have an agreement to sell half of their coffee, for example, to a fair trade coffee roaster, and then the other half, well, there isn't enough demand for fair trade, they're just gonna have to take it to market and sell it at non-fair trade prices. So this is part of the work that we do and part of the work that comes under that sort of promotion of fair trade chunk of the fair trade principles is that it's our job as people who are interacting with consumers regularly to encourage consumers to purchase fair trade. Because if you're not, then we run into this issue where fair trade producers do all the right things, they make all the right steps, but then they have no one to sell it to. The solution really, just buy fair trade whenever you can. If you're not able to switch out everything right away, then just try to switch out a few things. So coffee is really easy to switch out. Uh, chocolate is really easy to switch out. Uh, you can, you can, you're going to be buying these things anyway. You can swap out as many as you can afford uh, for fair trade alternatives. And then you're really making a huge difference. And if you can't afford to do a lot, like I had a buddy who was in university and she said, you know what, I can't afford a lot, but I'm going to buy all fair trade spices because spices, you don't go through that quickly. I can, you know, once a year, just do this big haul of fair trade spices and I can afford to do that when my OSAP check comes in or whatever. So it's, it's just these little steps as well make a big difference when everybody's doing a little bit. So I really encourage you to think about where can I work fair trade into my, into my uh, life and what are the substitutions that I can make uh, to, to make a difference to support these producers. Where can I buy fair trade products? Okay, so this is the fun part. There's stores that carry fair trade products, so local stores that you can go to. If you're in a town that has a 10,000 villages, you have a legend among you. <laughs> so 10,000 villages is great. They have a ton of um, handicrafts, jewelry, home decor, all that stuff. They have a small pantry. It's not a ton of stuff, but you'll find like maybe olive oil, chocolate, some tea maybe. Um, and your local health food or organic stores should in theory have tons of fair trade products. Again, maybe it'll depend, you know, how many, uh, how many, how many people are in your town, you know, how big is the selection, all that stuff. Uh, they'll have the more common items. So like coffee, tea, sugar, chocolate, but they might also have like soap, spices, things like that. So for the common items, you can also go to your grocery store, just your regular grocery store. Uh, they'll have things like coffee, tea, and sugar usually and chocolate. There's online options, so you can buy directly from Canadian fair trade companies. So, for example, Chaz Organics, Level Ground, Just Us, De La Plante, Etique & Co. Or from somewhere that offers all of the products in one place, which is exactly where uh, Rosette came from. Because the, really the goal was to make it easier for consumers to learn about and buy fair trade all in one spot. The nice thing is that you have all of the brands in one place so that you can bundle up on shipping because if you're ordering a few things from many different brands, that could be a ton of shipping. And that's not only expensive, it's really bad for the environment because you're shipping small amounts from all over the country to one place. Whereas if you have everything in one spot, you can ship out and have less of a less of a uh, environmental impact. We offer Canada-wide shipping precisely because not everyone is lucky as us. In Ottawa, in, we're really blessed because we have a 10,000 villages. We have Bridgehead, which is a huge coffee chain. There's like 20 locations. It's based out of Ottawa, but there's like 20 of them. It's huge. And we have like tons of health food stores. We have, you know, farm boys that all carry fair trade bananas. We have a ton of options in Ottawa. Not everyone is so lucky. If you're living in like Northern Ontario, you probably don't have a 10,000 villages or a ton of like health food stores, things like that. So this is why we offer Canada-wide shipping so that 
you're still able to get these types of products that otherwise maybe would not be available to you. We also have coming soon a fundraising program for schools, faith groups, and nonprofits, because you've probably all seen this thing where kids go around with chocolate bars selling them. Well, the irony cannot be lost on you that these children are going around selling chocolate bars that were probably made by children <laughs> and raising money doing it. So it's, uh, it's sort of to, to try to combat that and help, especially, uh, you know, organizations and so on that are socially and environmentally minded to have a fundraising outlet that is also ethical. And here's just a list of some of the products that are available on Rosette. So we do have rice, we have breakfast cereal, we have dried fruit, we have spices and baking ingredients like coconut, cocoa powder, cinnamon, nutmeg, etc. We have honey, we have soap and candles, and coming soon we actually have some clothing on its way in. So that's really exciting as well. So we're doing our best to have a good selection of all the different products that are available. And we're a tiny, tiny business. It's just one person and that's me <laughs> right now. So, uh, you know, I'm doing my best to, to be able to cover all those bases, but we're little, so we're really grateful for your patience as well. So that's all I've got today. Um, I hope you learned something. And please do visit rosettefairtrade.com slash blog to learn even more about fair trade on our blog. We have a ton of information. There's a contrast and compare between fair trade and organic. Uh, there's information about conventional trade versus fair trade. Uh, there's all sorts of recipes. It's, there's tons of stuff. So I really encourage you to check it out. And up next, we're going to be doing a fair trade Q and a. So I, Humbly ask that you subscribe for updates in the link that I'm going to throw in the chat right now before I forget. Um, and make sure that, uh, that you subscribe so that we can send you information on more free events like this one that are educational in nature. And that's it for tonight. I thank you for joining us and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye for now.